grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we have a question placed before Jesus. Uh, I might even call it the question of the ages. It's a question that haunts many people, including us. It has to do with our ultimate concern for eternal life. And we too seek the Master because we have questions. We know all the facts with our heads. We know that He has come to seek and save the lost. We know that He has found us, the lost, and we are secure in His love and grace. We are His forever. But then, why does our sinful human nature continue to ask this question? What must I do? What must I do to be saved? What must I do to inherit eternal life? And so I chose the sermon title, Inquiring Minds Want to Know. What do you think of? What's the first thing you think of when you hear that catchphrase, Inquiring Minds Want to Know? What do you think of? Nobody? Somebody got it last night. Very good. You were afraid to say it because, not you, you weren't afraid to say it, but you were afraid to say it because you thought, oh no, he'll know I read the National Enquirer, right? No. The National Enquirer, right? Inquiring minds want to know. You know that uh, awful gossip rag at the supermarket? You can't help but see it there as you're checking out. But did you know, actually, that that really came from E.F. Hutton? the investment firm way back when inquiring minds want to know and usually what do you think of with E.F. Hutton when E.F. Hutton talks or speaks people listen right that's what you think of but that used to be their catchphrase and then I don't know it was this was like back in the 60s or something and then I think it was in the 70s sometime maybe the National Enquirer co-opted that maybe it wasn't copyrighted or something by that time but it became just practically synonymous with the National Enquirer. Why? Because inquiring minds want to know. By the way, I used the American English spelling with the I rather than the British English spelling with the E. But anyway, it's something that's on our minds. We want to know. And in Mark's Gospel, we have a very focused young man who appeared by all intents and purposes to have the world by the tail. And yet he was interested in things that truly count, such as eternal life. He had many earthly riches to count. The king is in his counting house, counting out his money. He had those riches, and yet he searched and searched for the ultimate treasure. But he'd not yet found the answer, and so he came to Jesus in our gospel with the question of the ages. This is a man on a mission, a guy who is earnestly seeking, and you can imagine him seeking out all of these teachers of the faith, asking questions about life's deepest realities. And I can well imagine at least once one of his teachers may have told him, Son, if you want to have eternal life, if you want to be blessed in your life by God and live in his favor, then follow his teachings. Do all the right things. Put yourself to the task of doing God's will. Do your very best to keep his commandments perfectly in every way. And if you do this, then you'll be blessed. If you do this, then you'll have everything you desire, a happy life, a meaningful existence, and you will really make a difference. From a human perspective, not bad advice, right? But it focuses on what I must do. It focuses on the law. I've used this before in a sermon, but it's just so appropriate. I wanted to remind you of this cartoon that I saw one time where this apparently wealthy woman is leaning across the desk 
her pastor's desk with her checkbook out. And she says, Pastor, I don't do this repentance thing very well. Just give me the bottom line. And that is how I picture us when we try to bargain with God. God, I just don't do this repentance thing very well, so give me the bottom line. Our sinful human nature wants to know the answer to that question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And all the world's religions claim to have an answer for that, although their view of eternal life varies widely, and the road to get there even more so. And of course, only Christianity proclaims that one way, Jesus Christ. So we have our young friend in our text trying really hard to live according to the Old Testament law, as he followed the exhortation of his teachers, and by his own not altogether modest admission, he did use his time to do some good things for people. He helped others as he attempted to improve himself, and people apparently admired him and respected him. But there was something missing. There was something giving him a case of holy heartburn, discomfort, even pain. And that was guilt. His guilty conscience was driving him crazy. It gnawed at him. It nagged him. It troubled him. It haunted him. It accused him. You know all too well that ruthless, honest, self-appraisal that is like a grinding, persistent refrain that taunts and taunts and taunts. Not enough! You haven't done enough! Something is missing. You need to do more. You see, if this guy were satisfied, he wouldn't have sought out Jesus at all to ask him this question. And that is the problem. The wrong answer to the question can leave a person empty and longing with an aching heart and an accusing conscience. Survey after survey reveals that a disproportionate number of Christians say that they are trying to attain heaven by doing things like living a good life, and obeying the commandments, and get this one, trying to be a really good Christian. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but in your heart, in your heart, raise your hands if you are a really good Christian. You know, viewed from that perspective, I sure wouldn't be raising my hand, because I know all too well the sins of this weak flesh. But my question is, is there really such a thing as a good Christian and a bad Christian? (laughs) Or are you just a Christian who is a sinner struggling this side of heaven, who doesn't always do everything right, but who stands at the foot of the cross under the mercy and grace of God. If you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, in spite of your sins, in spite of what you have or haven't done, if you trust in Christ alone as your Savior, you are a Christian. Albeit a Christian struggling this side of heaven, and it's not an excuse to just plunge headlong into more sin. No, we want to live to please Him. But that helps put perspective on the whole question. And if we follow that line of thinking, then we too will live very sad lives. We will be this this desperate, vacillating, flailing in the wind, question mark. Have I done enough? Am I good enough? 
We will have no rest. We will have no peace. Our conscience will continue to attack and assault us, and there will only be a struggle to find excuses within us about why we feel lacking and empty and far from our goal and far from God. Why? Because we've never, never done enough. Wasn't that Luther's struggle in the 16th century? As he tried to beat the devil out of himself and drive him out and starve himself and punish himself in order to appease the anger of this wrathful judge of a God until he finally, by the power of the Holy Spirit, understood that the righteous will live by faith. Well, this young, rich man in our text, Matthew calls him a ruler, by the way, pretty important guy apparently, had heard of this rabbi teacher by the name of Jesus who performed miracles, who taught powerfully the counsel of God with astounding authority. And he thought, I will go to him. Maybe he can give me some insights that will help me lead a better life and lead me to inner peace and understanding. And so he seeks out Jesus. And unlike the Pharisees who were trying to trick and trap Jesus last week in our gospel, remember the whole thing about divorce and trying to trap Jesus. This guy, he's not trying to trap Jesus. He really wants to know, and he assumes that this Jesus actually has the honest answer, the right answer. And here's the best part of this whole text. I've been waiting for this. Mark writes, verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Uh, That's the gospel. Confirmation students, or confirmation students have to do these sermon notes where they have to identify the law and identify the gospel. Ding, 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 ding. This is the gospel, confirmation students, okay? He looked at them and he loved them. You know that Greek word agape, agape love, that undeserved, unmerited, boundless love of God, it literally says Jesus looked at him and agape him. That is the heart of the gospel. Those words literally drip with the sweet balm of the gospel. And what a wonderful moment it is for each and every one of us to hear those words that reveal the depth and the breadth and the height of our Lord's love for all people, even for poor, miserable sinners like you and me, who sometimes, and maybe all too often, ask all the wrong questions. Knowing his agape might prompt us to react with more compassion and care and concern for people who have religious truths confused, who have big question marks over their heads. And it might just encourage us to be more willing to enter into a dialogue with them instead of just condemning them outright because they simply don't understand. It's a teachable moment. I don't know about you, but it certainly helps me to understand that Jesus will be patient with my confusion and my misunderstanding and my wrong questions because Jesus alone has the answers. And so now Jesus, still loving this very confused man and still loving us, looks this man and us directly 
in the eye and says with a quiet voice, one thing you lack. Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. With that word, Jesus reduces this man and us to absolute zero in terms of attempting to apply good works toward the purchase of eternal life. It just won't work. It'll never happen that way. And here we thought we had kept the law perfectly since our youth. Ouch. The law hurts, doesn't it? And it's supposed to hurt because it shows us our sin. And it also shows us that we must let go of it in our quest for eternal salvation. You see, the law only drives us to our knees and shows us the enormity of our sin and prepares our hearts to receive the sweet agape of the gospel. What must I do to inherit eternal life? The full answer comes from Jesus. Come, follow me. The answer is found not in what I should do, but in what Jesus has done. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus. To follow means that you are no longer in charge. You have given up control. You are going to follow the only one who leads to life eternal. And in that one, you receive the gift of being with him forever. So you see, the good that you must do is faith in what Jesus, God's Son, has done. What he has done for us and our salvation in his sinful life, sinless life, excuse me, in his all-sufficient atoning death on the cross and in his victorious resurrection from the dead on the third day. And even that saving faith is a gift from God the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul knew that. Struck down by light from heaven, he is commanded to follow. His excellent knowledge of the law, gained at the feet of the famous Rabbi Gamaliel, meant absolutely nothing at this point of encounter with Jesus. Paul's desire to keep the law of Moses perfectly in every way turned out to be a futile attempt that he finally had to abandon forever. What about you? Paul was no longer the master, but he became the slave, waiting anxiously to hear what this Lord of life could possibly do with his sinful life. And what Paul learned, he recorded for all generations, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And then he goes on to say, for we are God's workmanship. We're God's artwork, if you will created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. What must I do? The young man asked a very good question, truly the question of the ages, and he deserved an answer, and he got that answer in one word, Jesus. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.